Cathedral Prep Presidential Debate, brought to you by the Class of 2017. Yeah! I'm not gonna lie, this election cycle has been one of the most stressful seasons in American history. There's a deep contrast between each of these candidates, and never in any of our lifetimes have we as an American people had the capability to choose what direction to take our country in than we have here in 2016. Politics really excites me. That's why we're having one of these today, because it excites a lot of you guys out there. Not due to elections, but for policy, and to enact change in our world, for the better. That's what this election is all about. About a choice between what policies you want as a person, or as an American one, and the act of voting is the exercise of that choice. It's at the foundation of our democratic nation, our American nation. Abraham Lincoln quoted about our country saying, my dream of America is a place where America will once again be seen as the last best hope on planet Earth. This is a time of choosing for many, but keep in mind what others have sacrificed for us to be in this position in the first place, and for us to be able to vote in the first place. We're blessed to be Americans. The debate today is a reflection of that. We hope for it to be fun, but educational, and please respect the two candidates up on the stage. They worked very, very hard for this, and it'll be a terrific time if you do that. Without further ado, I'll ask probably Jason to come up here, and we'll have a quick prayer, and we'll get this show on the road. All right, gentlemen, good morning. In 90 seconds or less, I have to explain to you the Catholic understanding of what we're going through as a country today. And so it starts from here from Psalm 37. And when we have heard from the book of the Psalms, the salvation of the just comes from the Lord. My friends, we are made just by the Lord. And how we live out how we have been made in good and in kindness is by living out that justice in obligation. We are obliged as nations of this great country to continue to protect and to promote justice as we have been made just by our risen Savior. We have that obligation then to put it into action through voting. We are reminded by paragraph 41 of forming, uh, this, uh, forming disciples and forming consciences in the United States by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops that our focus as a church and as members of this great nation is not on party affiliation, ideology, economics, or even competence and capacity to perform duties as important as, as such issues are. Rather, we are called to focus on what protects or threatens the dignity of every human life through the common good. That's why we are here today, fellas. And so as we begin this debate today, let us bow our heads in thanking God for the gifts that we have. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious Father, Father of every nation, Father of every land, we come before you this day thankful for the land that we live in, hopeful for what lies ahead, and also thanking you for the gift of justice of making us free in our own life. May we use the freedom that we have to both live out and protect our lives, our lives as a nation, our lives as a country, our lives in this world. It is through the intercession of Our Lady that we pray as the Immaculate Conception and Intercessor for our country, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Queen of Prep, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Play ball. Those of you that don't know me, I'm Mr. Patooch. Um, I'm the uh, government and politics teacher here at PrEP. Um, today... All right, today we are here to embrace one of the cornerstones of American democracy. Democracy, the right to vote. While many of you spectating today are not legally able to vote, being under the age of 18, experiences like this are essential in developing a sense of your own political values, expectations, and desires from political leadership. One of the things that I hope and the school expects of you is to learn uh, political respect and tact. A key component of American politics is the difference of opinions. It is okay, in many ways, and actually expected, for you to disagree with a significant portion of the population. 
However, it is not acceptable for you to demean, mock, or belittle people of different opinions. They have their perspectives, values, and opinions that are shared by their experiences the same way that yours have been. Listen to the positions of your opponents, understand their arguments, and possibly try to win them over to your positions or agree to disagree. Please, keep it positive. Any unsavory behavior like yelling, demeaning, or mocking of the students portraying the candidates is not acceptable. They've worked hard to cultivate the personas of the major party candidates to put on an informative debate for you. Thank you, gentlemen. Wages and the security 
of the American people. That's what comes first in the Trump campaign. And also, uh, it's just the southern border. It's not Canada. All right, commentators are stupid sometimes. <laughs> the southern border, it's only Mexico, and Mexico is going to pay for the wall. They're paying for the wall uh, because we're going to cut their visa programs out for, for the people that are in, that are in Mexico who do not pay for the wall. We're also going to impose tariffs so that, that they have to have it or else they're going to have a big trade deficit because we are the biggest trade partners. And right now, what we're losing in America is we're losing $300 billion a year, costing taxpayers that much, for a current broken system that Obama has right now and that Hillary is going to uphold. Thank you. Secretary Clinton, you have been quoted through WikiLeaks advocating for open borders. If this policy is true, how do you respond to the millions of Americans who have been harmed economically and physically through rampant, illegal immigration? First off, I'd like to begin with a big thank you to Senior Class President William Lewis and Senior Class Treasurer Daniel Scatella for organizing this wonderful event. Now let's talk about my policies. First of all, I believe that America should have an open border. The United Nations agrees with me, with me on this too, as they have advocated that countries open up their borders. Many of you are worried about this illegal immigration going on in our nation, but the borders are not the problem. Over 75% of illegal immigrants are flown into this country on work visas and overstay the limit. That is how they get in here illegally, not by crossing the border. Now, eliminating the militarized border would help our country twofold. First off, it would help our economies. There is a wide consensus among leading economists with both party affiliations that agree with me on this. According to Giovanni Perini, in states with more undocumented immigrants, skilled workers, not the undocumented workers, made more money and worked more hours. From 1990 until 2007, undocumented workers increased legal, legal workers' pay in complementary jobs by up to 10%. Many people point to the problem coming from the lack of an even distribution across our country of immigrants. That's why we need open borders, to allow more people in and help distribute people across America. This country started as a place where anyone could immigrate to it and prosper. Second, open borders allow for free movement out of the country as well as into the country. People who are working here and want to leave could easily leave. People whose families still live out of the country can easily move back in with their family, and we can help families reunite by opening up our borders both ways. Now we're going to move on to the, uh, the, the hot button issue of abortion, and we're going to try to keep these questions around one minute. All right, Secretary Clinton, you supported throughout the campaign the organization of Planned Parenthood, which although provides needed care to women, also has been credited with killing fetuses and using the parts for further medical exploitation. If you're elected president, will you continue this practice? All right, this is really a question of are you pre for preventing diseases and the top killers of Americans, or are you against preventing diseases and the top killers of Americans? Stem cell research has benefited people who suffer from cardiovascular diseases and heart attacks, the top two killers of Americans today. It also has helped victims of strokes, respiratory diseases, and diabetes, which are respectively third, fourth, and seventh on the CDC's list of top killers in the United States. Stem cell research also helps individuals who, serve, who suffer from neurological disorders, birth defects, and spinal cord injuries. Strict, sticking with strictly medical reasons, stem cell research is good. It can reduce the risk of complications while undergoing a transplant. This, the cells could possibly help the tissue accept one another between a donor and a receiver. This would save many American lives who cannot receive a transplant due to long wait lists and not having a match ready. Another minor benefit to stem cell research is the use of stem cells to regrow hair. Mr. Patooch, I have been told by many Cathedral Prep students that this could benefit you. <laughs> now, many people have this negative view of stem cell research because it involves cells taken out of aborted embryos, but that's not the case. Today, stem cells are, that are researched are, are, come from one of two sources. It is either from adults who have donated it, yes, adults can still grow stem cells, and it also has come from previous trials. That, and that is the goal of Planned Parenthood, is to benefit everyone through stem cell research and to prevent the death of Americans by, per, by preventing she preventable diseases. You can't, but you cannot go out. You can't do that, Will. Come to you. Come to you. So, Mr. Trump, Jerry, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about you a little bit here. Mr. Trump, during an interview with Chris Matthews earlier this year, he asked, "When you were a swinging bachelor in Manhattan, 
if you ever become involved or be involved with an abortion, you responded with such an interesting question. Next question. Could you further explain the statement and why you made the switch from pro-choice to pro-life in the recent months? So wait, first off, it's not are you for or against or, uh, a disease. It's either with abortion, are you for or against life, the right of life with people that we're all endowed with in America. And also, well, let me tell you, when I was in that interview, I went, I didn't answer this question. I said, uh, what I, what, and, uh, what happened is friends of mine years ago were going to have an abortion and they were going to have a child. So, and it was going to be aborted. And it wasn't aborted. And now the child today is a total superstar. He's a great kid. He makes lots of money. He just made, he's making America great again along with me. So, ever since I saw that, I was like, we should not have abortions. It's terrible. I'm completely pro-life. Uh, I saw it firsthand. It, we should be completely pro-life in America. It's not even an issue. It should not be an issue, especially in a Catholic school like this. We should all be pro-life. We are all pro-life. We should not do anything to hurt life. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Now we'll move on to the economy. Who we'll again, like last session, have about one minute to answer this question. Mr. Trump, we'll start with you. Yes. You have repeatedly said that the United States has been incredibly cheated in trade deals, specifically with China and Mexico. You call for extreme measures for companies to stay in country, a policy that the Pew Research firm thinks will cost the economy four million jobs. The United States is involved with over 150 different countries in trade. Yep. Under your presidency, how would you interact with those countries that are dependent on American business, and how would you guarantee more American jobs? Let me tell you, I'm the best with the economy. I know, you know, we, we all know. I'm the best with the economy. I built a business up. I'm a billionaire, all right? Let me tell you, I have a, create, a plan to create over 25 million jobs. 25 million American jobs for America. So that Pew Research and cut it. Uh, sounds great, yeah, I know, that sounds great. 25 million, you guys all have jobs. Um, what we're facing right now with the economy is the slowest recovery from a recession since the Great Depression. It's just so slow with the Obama, uh, the Obama administration and the Hillary administration. What they're doing, it's so slow, it's terrible. I'm going to restart the economy, I'm going to put so much money in the economy, it's going to be boom, it's going to be great. Now with these trade deals that we'll mention with China and with Mexico, let me tell you, China is a terrible country right now. What China's doing is it's manipulating its currency to get an upper hand on the market. So it's flooding its market with all this money, devaluing the currency, it's terrible. What I'm going to do, number one, on my day one, is label China as a currency manipulator. So we can get that and then we can put tariffs on them. But with NAFTA, uh, her husband imposed this thing. And it, it literally is probably the worst deal, along with the Iran deal, which I'll get to later, but one of the worst deals ever created in this United States. It is losing Americans' jobs on the almost the millions every year. And it even upped our trade deficit, which is almost a trillion dollars because of her husband. So NAFTA, oh, we're, we're going to be getting the same dumb thing with her looking off. It's not going to work. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Cut American Thank jobs and kill Thank American you, Mr. Trump. jobs. Thank you, Mr. Trump. <laughs> Thank right. you. Secretary Clinton, your opponent in the primaries, Bernie Sanders, was a big supporter of raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. You initially were against this, but then favored it. Meanwhile, the Financial Economy Education Center said that this would be net worse for the poor, and some states had even seen a decline in demand for these jobs through the rise of minimum wage, leading to the poor losing jobs. Could you explain why you switched this policy in the primaries, and how you could avoid the drawbacks of raising the minimum wage? Well, Daniel, I, first of all, I'd like to clarify, I never switched my policy to $15 an hour. I was, I've been advocating and will continue to advocate for $12 an, an hour federal minimum wage. And I will allow the states to increase that around 15, to, to around $15. That is what my policy does. It allows lies, the states to increase lies, it lies, more. Lies. You flip-flop on every single topic. Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, now your turn. All right, so this increase in minimum wage is actually proven to benefit the consumers and businesses alike. In many states that have increased minimum wage, we see people's wages increase by roughly 40%, but the goods and services they buy only by 4%. That, that shows that increasing minimum wage allows people to buy more products and services, and that allows the economies to start to boom more. There are Americans who need to work three jobs right now to pay to, li to live a decent life and have the necessities to life. However, if we increase the federal minimum wage to $12, this can be cut in half, or it can be cut down to one job. 
Now, you mentioned the research done by the Financial Economic Education Center, but this research only analyzes a jump in federal minimum wage from $7.25 to $12. It doesn't analyze my policy, which is to incrementally increase it over time. Right, that is how we are going to avoid the fallback. Thank you, Mrs. Secretary Clinton. You're welcome. All right. Keeps on running over time. You guys just don't care. <laughs> All right. It's the like, here you get fun up here, you know? Like, what is this? All right. Our next topic is foreign affairs. No, you, have, you have one minute to respond. Uh, Mr. Trump. Yeah. Your strategy for dealing with a foreign threat like ISIS was to simply bomb the explicit out of them. Let me pose this scenario to you. America falls a victim to a terrorist attack. Thousands perish. Yep. The group has no name or country identification. Would you come up with a more comprehensive strategy to deal with this attack? And if so, what would it be? Let me tell you. She, everywhere that she has been and she's touched is worse off. It, she is literally the creator of ISIS. She created ISIS and it's, look, I'm serious, I'm serious. She created ISIS. She, her and Obama tried to pull, she wanted to pull out of Iraq and look what we have now, all right? So that's her fault. Also, well, let me tell you what I'm going to do and Daniel. Well, assuming right now is people in the military and the government are giving precise details out in public as to what they're going to do to terrorist organizations like ISIS, like ISIL, and whoever, and uh, Boko Haram, those dang terrorists. And let me tell you, with them telling their plans out in the public, General Patton would be, uh, General Patton would be rolling in his grave at what he's seeing right now. We are giving away intel like it's never before. And these stupid politicians like Hillary Clinton are doing this. And uh, let me tell you, I'm not going to tell you my plan because if I told you my plan, then ISIS would just see and then just go away from the place that we're going to bomb. So it's stupid. I'm going to make America safe again. I'm going to put money back into, a mil into our military. Our military is at the, slow at the smallest size as, it, as it's ever been since World War I. It's despicable. It's terrible. It's because of politicians like her, they're right. shrinking the military and are undermining our power in the, in the world. Mr. Trump, thank you. Secretary Clinton, we're going to go over to you now. <laughs> You've long touted throughout this campaign that you served as Secretary of State. You went on and on about the whole 30 years from Mo Jumbo and your credentials. However, during your short tenure, you oversaw a massive rise in Russia, a rise in China, a somewhat failed pivot to Asia, and needless to say, a Benghazi incident that cost the lives of poor Americans. All her. So I guess all I have to say is, what makes a voter think you'll improve over what you did as Secretary of State? They can't. They can't. Thank you, Will, for asking why people should vote for me. Great question. So many of you know I've been in politics for roughly 30 years, but nobody knows really what positions I've held, or it's not common knowledge. So I'd like to clarify. From 1993 until 2001, I was the first lady of the United States with my husband, Bill Clinton. After Bill's presidency, him and I moved to New York. In New York, I ran for, sen for senator, and I won. I became the first female senator in the United States. It, I was senator until 2009 when my good friend Barack Obama, many of you know him as President Obama, appointed me Secretary of State. I served in this, in this role until 2013. Now you question my accomplishments as Secretary of State. First of all, when, uh, as our nation's chief diplomat, I didn't back down when the stakes were high. As Hamas rockets rained down on Israel, I went to the region immediately. 24 hours after I had arrived, there was a ceasefire in effect. And that year became Israel's quietest year in history. Second, I also persuaded Russia, China, and nine other U.S. Security Councils to impose sanctions on Iran. Now we will move on to the audience question. Finally, about time, right? We'll, we'll now move on to the, uh, the audience questioning period with Trey Dietrich. All right, we're here with uh, Jake Labonte, a senior from Cathedral Prep. He has a question for Hillary Clinton. Secretary Clinton, the question was asked in the first debate, how would you go about replacing Justice Scalia? As the election comes to a close, what quality do you look for most when making the decision to select the next justice, and who is your top, or, and who is your top choice to replace Justice Scalia? All right. So, first of all, I'm going to find someone who is willing to defend the rights of every American citizen. I urge we overturn this, that the appointee overturns the Citizens United ruling that we may know where the funding for political campaigns comes from and we can tell whether or not it is dirty money. I also wish the Senate would have approved President Obama's nominee because he would have been a very good justice. I have a list of people that I am willing to nominate into the Supreme Court. I do not 
have a top person right now, but when I become elected president after today, I will provide America with a direct answer as to who my top candidate is. All right, moving on to Ian Malczewski, a junior from Cathedral Prep, has a question for Mr. Donald Trump. Mr. Trump, as a person with disabilities, how can anybody with morals or sympathy respect you and give you their vote after you continue after you mock a reporter with disabilities and continue continuously use hurtful language? When I first did that, and I know that's a big controversy, but when I first did that to that reporter, I did not know he had a challenge with him. And I do I apologize for that straight up. Now, Ian, your story as a politician touches me very deeply, and let me tell you, you're not, you're not going to lose any rights being made uh, by voting for me or under my administration. You're, if anything, you're going to gain rights. I'm going to help you every step of the way, and I, I bet you that you probably have a lot of medical bills right now. I, I assure you that you do. And with Obamacare right now, with the health care system so broken right now, it's only going to get worse and worse for you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a single pair of health care that's going to be so much better for all of you, and it's going to be so much better for you. Thank you, Mr. Trump. I now go over to Luke Beloga asking some questions to some teachers. <laughs> all right, we're uh, here with Mr. Bible, and he has a question for Secretary Clinton. <laughs> Secretary Clinton. When I vote, I realize that I'm not just choosing a person to be president. I'm also choosing the main person the entire Congress will be reacting to for the next four years. Our most recent Congress has set records for least bills and laws passed, government shutdowns, vetoes, and overrides. Many people suspect this is because the relationship between the executive and legislative branches has been so hostile. The Senate majority leader has even been quoted. It does not matter what the president chooses. He will not allow it. How are you going to prevent such a hostile atmosphere so our government can start being productive again? Well, Mr. Bible, that's a great question. So I'm going to be able to work with Congress because, first of all, I've been campaigning hard for down-ballot candidates that are going to be willing to work with me and pass my policies through Congress. Second off, there are many Republicans in both the Senate and the House that respect me and my political ideas that are going to be more willing to work with me than Donald Trump. Third, Bill Clinton had the had Newt Gingrich had a Newt Gingrich led Congress, and he got bills passed. He got laws into legislation, and he got policies passed. That is the type of mindset that I will be bringing. Someone who is willing to work with the majority, and after this election, we may have a Democratic majority that will be willing to work with me. That's how I plan on getting things done. But that was your husband that did it with you, not you. I worked with my husband. Well, he didn't work with you too well. <laughs> Next question. All right. Now we have Mr. Killy who has a question for Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump, the yeah. day has finally arrived. The country will elect our next president today. During this very unusual campaign, you have said a lot of controversial things to a lot of different people. It seems to me and a good portion of the American people that you do not care what you say and how you say it to anyone. I think that your chances of winning would be so much better if you were more careful on how you choose your words. My question is this. Looking back, do you regret anything that you have said during this campaign or anything that you have done in your past? If the answer is yes, please elaborate. But if the answer is no, Please tell this audience why you feel this way and how you think that this will help you win this election. Great, great, great question, Mr. Killian. And I hear that you're a great teacher around here. Is that true, Mr. Killian? Great. Oh, very nice. Well, many of you know of that controversy when I walked out of that bus and said some wrong words. And uh, I, I, apologize, I apologize for that. I apologize to all of them to uh, my American people. Let me tell you, Mr. Kelly, when I started this campaign, I started off with a lot of the news people, the biased news, like the CNN up here, Clinton News Network. They say it's really just bad things, but I'm just telling the truth. Would you rather have someone more upright and tell you the truth, or have someone lie to you, and stay in the back and just say and just wander around the question? I would much rather, I bet you would much rather have someone upright, tell you the truth, tell it once. Now, that's what I'm going to do as president also. However, I'm not going to be campaigning when I am president. So I'm going to be more on the nice Trump side. 
I'll be more under, a lot of people say under control, I'll be much nicer, and especially when I'm with like, my adversaries, I will be much more cordial with them, as I talk to them and make these great trade deals, deals that will make America great again and strong again. Thank you. I'm over here with Joe Tice Sr. He has a question for Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump, what steps should be taken to prevent the growing and already present economic gap between the poor, middle, and wealthy classes? Very, very good question, Joe. Let me tell you. What's going on right now is that the Obama tax plan, and also kind of sponsored by Hillary, and it's completely tearing this country apart, and it's, and it's, and it's uh, creating that huge gap that we see today. So what I'm proposing is this tax plan that has been constructed by many of the former people of, under Reagan, under his economic uh, program. W what, what I'm doing, and this is great because it's going to be thriving for everybody that is in the lower class and the middle class and even the upper class to make America thrive once again. W what, what I'm proposing is if you make under $75,000 a year, you'll only tax 12%. More than 75, but less than 200, uh, 200 a thousand, you'll get taxed uh, one fourth of your pay, and more than 225, you'll be only taxed one third. So what's doing? It's going to give money back in the people's pockets, so we don't need this stupid uh, rate up in uh, minimum wage. We just need lower taxes. Lower taxes makes everyone die, thrives. We can put the money back in the market, and just makes everything better. So the, the taxes lower across the board, lower for businesses everywhere. It's going to make America thrive, and there's going to be and that wealth gap that everyone's going to be brought up is going to be much, much better in my mind. Thank you very much to our audience members for asking our questions. We're going to ask two more questions to the candidates before we go into the candidate crossfire. Daniel, you have All right. Secretary Clinton, how do you feel that you are characterized as a reckless and very untrustworthy person? Do you feel that this is warranted after an email scan? Very untrustworthy. This is very warranted. No, this is not warranted. I am a very careful person, and I maintain my temperament. I am calm. I am collected. I am not Donald. I do not lash out at others, and I always make sure to have a correct response to things. Now, this email scandal. So, as many of you know, my emails were on a private server. This server I used to communicate classified documents with other government officials. However, the FBI has investigated me many times over this and has come up with nothing to put me in jail or to prosecute me with. There has been nothing revealed by these documents that are going to... But what has been revealed, Hillary, is that you have blatantly, and the FBI director said this, which you should be in jail, you should be in jail, Hillary. You did terrible, terrible, terrible things in the country. Wait, 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 the weekend has like 700,000 seconds. <laughs> are, you, are you serious? The FBI, it's rigged. The, it, the system is rigged. She's in the middle of it. Definition of corruption right here. Mr. Trump, we're going to come to you now. So you have repeatedly said about your video with Billy Bush, I think we've all seen, that this is an example of locker room talk yes. and locker room banter. Would you say that those kind of words are said in a regular locker room? And what would be some other examples of locker talk? And do you think a president should be saying these words? Now, Will, first off, first off, Will, this was seven plus years ago, okay? This is before I even got into politics, even thought about going into politics, right? This is a long time ago, and I apologize for that again. Okay, I apologize, we all know about apologize, all right? That, that case of close. Now, I've been in many locker rooms before, and we do talk about women, right? I hope, and I don't want to talk about her. <laughs> but we do. And now we don't use derogatory terms. No, I didn't, and I again apologize for that. But we talk about women, and it gets sometimes, you know, like, oh, like, you say, I don't want to get into details. But it gets like, you know, we talk about women. So, yes, it is standard locker room talk. It was just me and Billy, we're having fun. It was a great time, all right? We're just having fun. Yeah, I didn't know we had a mic on me. How was I supposed to know? It was cheap. 
And how do you feel about the 11 different women who have accused you of sexual assault and even the 13-year-old that accused you of rape? Lot. The news, a woman from the USA, um, she was Miss USA, I believe, very great looking woman, that one, but very good looking woman, but she came out of the news and said that the Washington Post contacted her to see if, they can, if she can say anything. They were paying her to say anything against me, so I will, I will not get elected. They're paying her. So it's lies. It's blatant lies that get from the Hillary campaign and from her liberal media that are going against me. It, it's BS. I'm sorry, but it's just so bad. They're going against me. It, it's lies. Blatant lies, which and she knows about a lot about lies. Let me tell you, she knows a lot about lies. All right. Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? We're on that one. Yeah. Say very quickly. Would you care to talk about the Clinton Foundation investigation that's currently going on by the FBI? <laughs> the Clinton Foundation investigation. So that was. That was, wasn't that the one that was just wrapped up? Sorry, I'm totally No, the Clinton Foundation. <laughs> What's going on right now is that they just saw the WikiLeaks, which is awesome. They're finally exposing somebody in this country. See, the definition of corruption right here. What WikiLeaks just released the other day is that the Clinton Foundation <laughs> is actually, they paid for Chelsea and Clinton's wedding, her daughter's wedding, the Charity Foundation paid for her daughter's wedding. Come on. Corruption, corruption, corruption. We need to drain the swamp. The people in Washington are so corrupt, she is the utter definition of corruption. It's terrible. It is terrible. She's corrupt. We cannot let her in the White House. Okay. We're going to move on to our next segment in this presentation, and it will be candidate one versus one. So we're going to start out with Secretary Clinton. You will have two minutes to respond to anything that Donald has said throughout the debate. You said a lot of stuff. Secretary Clinton, you said a lot of stuff, so I think we'll be able to fill this up. So let's hear what you have to say. All right, so Donald, first of all, you said that we're going to build a wall, and it's going to be, quote, huge. Yep. So over 75% of illegal immigrants are flown into the country and overstay their work visas. How, are you, how is your wall going to prevent this from happening? So... What's going on with the planes coming in? They're not coming in through planes. They're jumping over the border. They come in, they're coming over. I was just endorsed by the ICE, which is the leaders of the border. So they, I, I just got endorsed them. They see these people flooding in over this wall. I mean, not over the wall, but over these fences, over these little barriers that they call them. And they just let them in. They just let them in. They need this change. And what you're calling for is these open borders. You know how many millions of people have flooded the United States? It's still our job, Hillary. All right, so you've been very anti-immigration. However, many of no, your jobs... No, I'm over, not. Almost 90% of your hotel employees, mm -hmm. you have drawn in from other countries and given work visas. How are you for the American when you are bringing in people from other countries? To I'm anti-illegal immigration. Illegal immigration. Only anti-illegal immigration. Those people are coming in legally. They have work visas. Some are citizens. They're legal in the United States. I am anti only anti illegal immigration. You want you want to, you want to come here illegally? Come come come. Let's go. Hey, Mr. Shops, do you have any questions for Secretary? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. All right. So Hillary, um, no, no, I'll do that one. Let's see. Along with this undocumented uh, people coming to countries, so I'm going to ask you some questions. Are you? for undocumented people coming into the country. Yes, it helps you improve our okay. economy. That's what what, I about earlier. What, what do you say about how, how would it improve the economy? How would it improve the economy? So they are usually in routine, uh, they are in routine jobs where they are cleaning the floors or they are okay. doing busy work. And that allows so they're getting specialized employed. individuals to work harder on their specialized mm -hmm. tasks. Yeah, thank you. And, and that so they're them. getting employed by the U.S. workforce, correct? Yes. So they're stealing U.S. jobs? No. Why not? They are not stealing jobs from anybody. But they're getting employed, aren't they? They are getting employed, yes. What's the unemployment rate of the United States right now? I don't have that statistic. Okay. Well, right now it is around 5%. So that's 5% of Americans that would want to take that job, but these illegals are taking this job. So what she, what she wants is people flooding the country, taking maybe these teachers' jobs some days too. It's, it's terrible. Yeah, maybe yours is long. We don't know. We don't know. Hey, you know, scientists are crazy. But 
is that what's going to happen? It's getting, it's, getting, it's getting a snowball. It's getting worse and worse. Every year, it's just getting worse and worse. Thank you very much. We cannot let that happen with her. We thank, cannot thank you. corrupt her. We're going to have a, uh, the, the third party candidate no. come up to the stage for a couple seconds. Gary Johnson.
going to make the right choice in who they elect as president and who will be inaugurated on January 20th. Yeah. So I want you to get out to the polls today. I want you to get out and put Hillary Clinton on your ballot. I can help save American lives, I, and I can help improve the quality of living throughout America. Let's prevent someone like Donald, someone who is always against Americans, who has said very rude and indecent things about every American person from, from obtaining office. Choose someone who is listening to the people and who is with the people and for the people. And that candidate is not Donald Trump. That candidate is me. I have provided many policies as to how I plan on actually fixing these problems that have come up in this debate. However, Donald just likes to brag about his huge wall. He has never talked about how it's going to be funded. He says that Mexico is going to pay for it. But Mexico has very blatantly said they will not. He has yet to provide any other policies as to how he actually plans on removing illegal immigrants from America. However, I plan on incorporating them and welcoming them to America. All in all, Donald Trump has no policies that you can actually vote for at the end of the day. And Hillary Clinton, me. Go on my website and you'll see all my policies right there. Policies. Thanks, Hillary. Yeah. Could have talked to you. Okay. Thank you very much, candidate. That wraps up our debate today. Daniel Stone.